Hello, my name is Asia Darbinian, and I am the Executive Director of Change, the Center for Holocaust, Human Rights, and Genocide Education housed at Brookdale Community College in Lincroft, New Jersey, on the territory of Lenny Lenape people. I welcome you to Change's virtual program reflecting on the recent catastrophic events in Artsakh, Nagorno-Karabakh. A couple of quick housekeeping items regarding tonight's program. Um, you will note that your audio is muted. It will remain muted throughout the program. But the chat feature is enabled, so please feel free to communicate with one another through the chat box. At the end of the presentation, please feel free to type your questions into the chat box and we will get to as many as possible. Before we begin, I also would like to thank Change Stuff, Suzanne Esterman, Rachel McCauley, and Susan Yellen for making this Zoom program possible. An extra warm thank you to our program sponsors, Pam and Howard Dorman, Marie and Joan Haitayan, Cynthia McCormack, Adrian and Richard McComber, as well as to our donors and members. Tonight's program was born from a number of conversations. I've had a change with our board of directors, volunteers, staff, who for months had witnessed the local Armenian communities and my own frustration over Azerbaijan's illegal blockade of Artsakh. First, we witnessed the starvation of Artsakh's 120,000 indigenous Armenians and the inaction of the global community to intervene on their behalf. Then, we saw Azerbaijan's brutal attack on Artsakh and the ethnic cleansing of its population a catastrophic event that resulted in the exile of 100,000 Artsakhsis into the Republic of Armenia in September, 2023, creating yet another humanitarian crisis. The questions raised during the mentioned conversations a change with our board member, Armen McComber's active participation confirmed the need for a discussion that would introduce changes diverse audiences to and educate them about the history of the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan and reflect on the most recent shocking developments in Artsakh that somehow were left out of the news coverage locally and globally. Tonight, we're fortunate to have with us Professor Donoyan to discuss the history of Artsakh Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, why it matters, and what may come next. A native of Gyumri, Armenia, Dr. Artyom Donoyan is a sociologist and visiting professor of global studies at Hamlin University in St. Paul, Minnesota. His research interests include sociology of religion, religion and politics in the South Caucasus, and religion and nationalism in post-Soviet Russia. His articles have appeared in Demokratizatia, the Journal of Post-Soviet Democratization, Society, and Modern Greek Studies Yearbook, among others. He has been a frequent guest on the BBC, Deutsche Welle, France 24, and other news outlets. Dr. Donoyan is the editor of the recently published volume, Black Garden of Flame, the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict in the Soviet and Russian press. His current research project is a monograph on the social, historical, and political underpinnings of the Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict. Thank you for joining us this evening, Professor Donoyan. Now I will mute myself and hand it over to you. Thank you for the kind introduction, Asia, and thank you, Change, uh, for inviting me uh, to talk about this very important topic. And I hope and uh, pray that I will do justice uh, to this very grave matter, this very important topic that has not nearly got the coverage that it deserves, um, given the size of the humanitarian catastrophe that occurred just a couple of months ago. <clears throat> 
um i will i will share my screen so we can go up through the powerpoint presentation so before i begin some uh, preliminary remarks um i love to read and when i'm uh, melancholic and these days uh, there's lots of melancholy melancholy affairs happening across the world. I usually go back to one of my favorite books uh, ever written. It's the book of Job from the Hebrew Bible. And uh, this morning when I <clears throat> was preparing to go to work, I picked it up again. Uh, what a way to begin your day by reading the book of Job. And uh, there was a verse that really struck me. And uh, just to give you an idea uh, about this conflict, not no conflict, no crime occurs in a vacuum. And I think no one has captured this sentiment better than the poet that authored the book of Job. And the verse goes like this, or not the verse, I'm not going to read the entire verse, but just one sentence that really stuck with me this morning and it goes like this for crime does not spring from the dust and the person who translated this uh, verse or this book or the hebrew bible entirely there is a, a very well-known jewish american uh, old uh, uh, hebrew bible scholar named robert alter is one of my favorite probably uh, exegetes of the hebrew bible uh, comments on this verse by saying moral mischief is perpetrated by conscious human agents it does not just spring up spontaneously like grass or weeds so that to sort of give you the idea uh, and and the thrust of the presentation that like all conflicts Nagorno-Karabakh conflict also has its own peculiar context and it's a very important context for us to know and to understand and I'm glad I have the opportunity to do so. And I, again, like I said earlier, I hope to do justice to it. Uh, but let's get to it, I guess. So just to give you an idea where Nagorno-Karabakh is with relations uh, to other uh, geographical locations, I pres here is a map of the former Soviet Union. You see this vast area and you can see on the uh, left side, on the bottom, the uh, South Caucasus republics, Georgian SSR, Armenian SSR, Azerbaijan. And you see, uh, if you can't see, make it on your screens with number eight. It's the Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Oblast that was created uh, by the Soviet Union. But let's zoom in for a, a more closer look. This is how the area looks like the South Caucasus, the Georgia, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Nagorno-Karabakh closer to the right corner, uh, bottom right corner. Just to give you an idea for those of you who uh, have heard about it, but cannot make it on, on the map for one reason or another. Um, so uh, having sort of set it up for you, I would like to uh, explain uh, on the roots of the conflict a bit. I'm not going to uh, be expansive on this, but give you enough information for you to uh, sort of understand the context of the conflict. So there is several ways of looking at the conflict. And there is one way of looking at it. It's that it's an ancient conflict going all the way to Cain and Abel and the first sin in, 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 in the Garden of Eden, but it's infinite regress, I'd like, uh, and, and it doesn't help us understand the conflict at all. But the conflict, uh, it's most uh, sort of uh, big context is about 100 years old. Uh, initial clashes that happened in, the, in mountainous Karabakh or Nagorno-Karabakh region around 1905 to 1907 to what was known as the armeno-tatar wars or the armenian uh, 
Tatar Wars, Azerbaijanis back then were known under different ethnonyms. Tatar was one of them. They were also known as Azerbaijani Turks. They were also known as just simply Muslims. So the uh, the first clashes over the region, or one of the or or this most significant clashes over the region appear uh, happened in 1905 through 1907. Uh, mutual bloodletting is happening. Mutual uh, massacres are happening, and then it picks it up again in 1918 through 1920, where again massacres, deportations, uh, and 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 mass mutual killings are happening as this as the Tsarist Empire is collapsing and as Russia has entered World War One. In nineteen eighteen over which are known as then but that, uh, the Armenian and, and Georgian experience the uh, uh, the uh, Sovietization of the region. The Red Army enters into Armenia uh, is initially recognized in Nagorno-Karabakh as part of Armenia. Uh, and it, uh, the recognition of Part of Armenia is also done. Azerbaijan's clear uh, for the next. So in 1921, Gorno Karabakh is part of Armenia, is reversed, placing the Gorno Karabakh within Soviet Azerbaijan as an autonomous region. Uh, historians have grappled over this. Much ink has been shed over this as to why. Joseph Stalin would come to this decision, but we still do not know how and why Stalin arrived at the decision. We just know that Stalin, uh, who was at the time the Commissar of the Nationalities, uh, on a whim, but for some probably uh, not yet fully articulated economic and political reasons, awards Nagorno-Karabakh to Azerbaijan, which, as you can imagine, is not something that the Armenians of the region uh, would fully agree to. And at the time of the award, awarding of Nagorno-Karabakh to Azerbaijan, what emerges uh, 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 and, and the formation of the mountainous Karabakh Autonomous Oblast, or Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Oblast inside Azerbaijan, uh, what emerges is a size of 4,400 square kilometers and a total population of around 162,000 uh, by, uh, uh, by the 1979 census, of whom 123,000 were Armenian, which would be nearly 90% uh, of the total population of Nagorno-Karabakh. And on this map, you can see uh, the villages and the towns populated by Armenians in red. And with green, you can see the villages and towns populated uh, by Azerbaijanis mostly. So this was, uh, as you can see on the map, even it becomes quite uh, visual, the pre predominance of Armenians as the ethnic majority of this autonomous republic within Azerbaijan. Uh, then, uh, what happens with the Sovietization of the region is that uh, the Soviet uh, uh, government puts the lead on the conflict. Those that protested uh, the transfer of Nagorno-Karabakh to Azerbaijan would be repressed, either sent to jail or would be deprived of their livelihood and would end up migrating to either Armenia or to Russia. But what happened is that the Soviet Union, in essence, froze the conflict, put a lid on it, nipped it in the bud, as, as they like to say in uh, my neck of the woods in Minnesota. But the grievances that the Armenians had with the political decision with Stalin would remain. Uh, so what were these grievances that would remain and persist and simmer? Uh, 
So there were a number of uh, grievances that the Armenians sort of nursed over the next seven decades of being part of Soviet Azerbaijan. So economic grievances. What happened is that Azerbaijani leadership that had control, administrative control over Nagorno-Karabakh had initiated a set of economic policies that would be sidelining Armenians, depriving them of work or work opportunities or social mobility and so on and so forth. In, if, if a new factory was built, most likely, let's say, Azerbaijanis uh, would be bringing their own workers rather than employing local Armenian population. Other set of grievances were cultural and religious. Nearly all churches, not nearly all churches, but really all churches in Nagorno-Karabakh uh, were shuttered. And if there were any faithful or pious Armenians that would like to continue in their religiosity, they would not have the opportunity to, for instance, baptize their children or to have a wedding or a funeral administered by a priest uh, or, or a local parish priest and so on and so forth. So in order for baptize their children, for instance, Armenians had to travel either to Baku, which was quite far, about seven, eight hours of uh, driving to Azerbaijan's capital where there was one functioning Armenian church, or they had to invite in, invite priests from Armenia to travel essentially incognito and hold secret baptism ceremonies for, for the children and the newborn and so on and so forth. Other set of grievances were language and education. Armenians were not, by the time you get to 1980s, Armenians are not allowed to study in schools uh, 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 in Armenian, Armenia, there is no Armenian textbooks uh, coming to Azerbaijan. To, so the education is mostly in Azerbaijani and in Russian language and so on and so forth. And in 1960s, uh, these grievances sort of come to a head very briefly. In 1964, Armenians uh, from Nagorno-Karabakh uh, write a letter to the Soviet supreme uh, uh, leadership uh, asking for the transfer of Nagorno-Karabakh to Armenia, uh, sort of uh, asking the Soviet government to uh, right the historic and what Armenians consider moral wrong by transferring Nagorno-Karabakh to Azerbaijan. But these letters were ignored and those that initiated their letter writing campaigns were persecuted and prosecuted. But something very important happens at the tail end of 1970s that sort of defines the farther trajectory of the war. Heydar Aliyev, the father of the current president of Azerbaijan, Ilham Aliyev, was a KGB general, becomes the first secretary of the Central Committee of Azerbaijan's Communist Party in 1969. And shortly thereafter, he inaugurates uh, a new era of identity politics, implementing a set of economic and demographic policies aimed at reducing Armenian presence in the Nagorno-Karabakh region. And the end result of these economic and demographic policies were that the Armenian population, which was at the time of uh, Azerbaijan, uh, at the time of its inc of incorporation of Nagorno-Karabakh into Azerbaijan, would fall from around 90% to 75% which also meant uh, a net loss of 15%, which also meant a net, a net gain of 15% of Azerbaijani population in Nagorno-Karabakh. So by the, time of, uh, by the time we get to the end of 1980s, the demographic change is quite steep. You have 75% Armenians, 25% Azerbaijanis, but Armenians also are pointing out the fact that another region called Nakhichevan, where Armenians at the time of its own incorporation into Azerbaijan, uh, at the same time as Nagorno-Karabakh was incorporated, and there was about 40%, 40-45% of Armenians in Nakhichevan, but by 1988, the Armenian population has been reduced to a measly 2% of the entire population. So Armenians are pointing that, pointing out that what awaits Nagorno-Karabakh Armenians is the fate of what happened to the Armenians in Nakhichevan. A slow 
demographic change that would essentially denude Nagorno-Karabakh of its Armenian population. Uh, well, these sort of grievances persist, uh, but they are not public and they're not publicly aired until uh, mid 1980s. And what happens in mid 1980s is that Mikhail Gorbachev becomes uh, the leader of Soviet Union, of the Soviet Union, and he initiates two sets of uh, policies aimed at liberalization of the Soviet economics economy and the liberalization of uh, the Soviet public discourse. Uh, those of you that are of my age and older probably remember those two slogans that defined the Gorbachev era. One was Perestroika, the second was Glasnost which means restructurization and freedom of speech. And when freedom of speech were granted, one of the earliest people to take advantage of the freedom of speech were the Armenians in Armenia and in Nagorno-Karabakh. So what freedom of speech meant in effect and in reality was that any issue that the Soviet Union had deemed unorthodox, unkosher, and forbidden hitherto would be able to be aired publicly, discussed, debated, and decisions would be made in a democratic fashion. And Armenia started in Armenia protesting a couple of things. Uh, in 1986, you remember a nuclear power plant uh, disaster in Chernobyl and Ukraine. Uh, and in 1987, Armenians in, in Armenia began an environmental movement, uh, which had to do with the uh, Chernobyl disaster. Why? Because uh, almost a carbon copy of the same nuclear power plant that existed in Chernobyl had been built in around the same time, not far from Armenia's capital of Yerevan in a town called Metsamor, there was a nuclear power plant and it's a seismically active zone and the Armenian youth and intellectuals and students from the universities began an environmental movement asking for the closure of the uh, nuclear power plant and other environmentally unfriendly uh, uh, enterprises in the territory of this in the ter territory of Soviet Armenia and these are a couple of posters from that era. As you, on the left side, you see uh, letters A-E and uh, the, the uh, moon, which also depicts the Turkish flag. AIS means NPP in, in English, basically nuclear power plant. And on the right, you see uh, a poster closing, uh, calling for the closure of the artificial rubber plant in the midst of Yerevan. So the, uh, it started an environmental uh, protest, but transmogrified soon enough into a national liberation movement and so on and so forth. And in 1988, soon after uh, these environmentalist protests, uh, the, uh, the, this, the public discourse began uh, it's a slow but steady, but also quite dramatic transformation into calling for uh, the reunification of Nagorno-Karabakh with Armenia. So first demonstrations happened in uh, in Stepanakert, in Nagorno-Karabakh's capital, in February of 1988. Uh, and the demonstrations are bolstered by Armenian intellectuals from Nagorno-Karabakh and Armenian intellectuals in Armenia and in Russia calling for the Soviet Union to take a second look on the issue of Nagorno-Karabakh. Then it snowballs from there. Major demonstrations are happening in major Armenian cities in the capital, the second, the third largest cities. And then in a very unprecedented move, uh, the Nagorno-Karabakh Armenian parliament or the Soviet uh, votes to reunify with Armenia, circumventing the existing uh, power structure in the Soviet Union and essentially ignoring Azerbaijan altogether, directly appealing to Moscow. As you can imagine, 
that would not sit well with Azerbaijani communist leadership, nor would it sit well with the communist leadership in Moscow. And what followed uh, to these peaceful gatherings and peaceful protests in the streets of Yerevan, in the streets of Stepanakert, was a violent outbreak in, in a city not far from Azerbaijan's capital, in, uh, in, in uh, uh, Azerbaijan's capital of Baku. And I remember this day, my, I grew up uh, in a communist family or with a communist father. And my father subscribed religiously, almost you can say, to the Soviet newspaper Pravda. And I have the page uh, of Pravda with the coverage of the pogroms in, in Sumgait. Number one, uh, the pogroms in Sumgait didn't attract the full attention of the Soviet government. And you can see an entire page, the second page, only on the bottom, you can see the telegram from Baku uh, saying what is happening. And this is the text. On February 28, a group of hooligan elements provoked disturbances in Sumgait. There were instances of outrages and violence. Measures have been taken to normalize life in the city to ensure discipline and public order. Investigative agencies are conducting an inquiry. That was it. And I remember this. And my father, who had become quite politically aware at that time, was utterly disgusted by the Soviet central press coverage of the massacre of the Armenians in, in Sumgait. And he, I remember him just throwing this paper away in disgust uh, at, the, at the fact that the Soviet government was trying its best to cover up the crime of what happened in Sumgait. And what happened in Sumgait was a massacre of civilian Armenians uh, by Azerbaijani youth who descended upon the Armenian quarters of the city and killed uh, officially 26 Armenians, and there were uh, six Azerbaijanis who would be die who would be killed by Armenians who were defending themselves. The that's the official numbers, but in the Soviet Union, you could never really trust the official numbers, and probably in most likelihood, the numbers were close to 200, if not more, in reality. And what happened is that Sumgai was essentially the first. Uh, salvo, uh, uh, foreboding and forewarning a larger conflict. An Armenian-Swiss researcher, Vigen Chaterian, uh, puts it quite succinctly in his book. Before Sumgait, it was possible to imagine a deus ex machina intervening and calming the passions, proposing compromises or imposing a new order. After Sumgait, such an eventuality became hardly possible. So Sumgai essentially let out the genie out of the bottle, and the genie was quite violent in his farther exploits. So there were a number of ways that the Soviet government could react to Sumgai, and the way it went about reacting to it was possibly, at the time, reasonable but wrong-headed nonetheless. So Soviet government dispatches high-ranking of, of, uh, Soviet officials to try to calm passions, to, to, to put a lead and to, uh, to put genie back in the bottle. But as we know from life experiences, you cannot put a toothpaste back into the tube. It's, it, 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 it's, it's unseemly as it were. So Azerbaijan, what happens next is that Azerbaijani nationalist intellectuals start spinning counter narratives regarding Sumgait, justifying it, uh, creating some false narratives of justification. But also what followed were disturbances, further disturbances in Azerbaijan and Armenia. But logic of violence had already taken its course and uh, it was becoming the conflict, a wider conflict, was becoming essentially inevitable, and where, the, uh, of course, uh, the, most of the victims would end up being civilians. But Sumgait was not the only uh, uh, massacre, early massacres of civilians. Uh, 
other such uh, uh, pogroms against Armenians would follow. Uh, in November of 1989, Armenian uh, civilians in the second largest uh, Azerbaijani city at the time known as Kirovabad, today it's called Ganja, happens. But it, the violence reaches its apogee in January uh, 12 through 14 of 1990, where Armenians in uh, the Azerbaijani capital, Baku, are essentially hunted down en masse and killed en masse. Again, official numbers put the numbers about 100, but unofficially, probably 200, 300 Armenian civilians would be killed. And one uh, famous individual that would escape the violence uh, would be the very, uh, the world famous chess champion, Gary Kasparov, who is of, uh, of uh, joint Armenian and Jewish stock. Uh, Kasparov, uh, uh, Soviet government would dispatch a special plane for Kasparov to be evacuated, and he would evacuate uh, with him about 100 Armenian civilians uh, to Russia, escaping and his mother among them. And what happened? Uh, the next round of violence would be uh, Operation Ring in January of 1990, where Azerbaijan would essentially, with the help of the Soviet troops, start. Uh, implementing ethnic cleansing policies against the Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh, which then would uh, uh, further uh, make the conflict even worse. But that's during the Soviet Union. What follows soon is Armenia in 1990 declares independence, so does Azerbaijan, and so does Nagorno-Karabakh. And what happens is that a conflict that was initially an intrastate conflict, that is conflict that was happening within one state, the Soviet Union, became internationalized. And now the conflict was essentially between three parties, Nagorno-Karabakh, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. But Nagorno-Karabakh, it should bear reminding that was not recognized as an international, uh, internationally was not recognized as, an, uh, as, as a separate country or independent country. So technically, the war uh, would be between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Although Nagorno-Karabakh had its own uh, political structures, had its own military and paramilitary and so on and so forth. Uh, then the conflict becomes transformed. If during the Soviet era, the Soviet government had control over the weapons, and a, a war was fought with hunting rifles and, 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 and so on and so forth. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, Armenia and Azerbaijan get their portion of the Soviet military machinery. And the conflict takes on a new dimension, a new violent dimension, where the, uh, where, where the casualties grow exponentially and so on and so forth, where hundreds of people would die uh, and thousands of people actually would die at, 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 at the end of the day, 25,000. Uh, the war would claim 25,000 people. In 1992, uh, 1991, Armenians uh, from Stepanakir storm a city called Kojali, where not far from, an Azer, uh, from the only airport that allowed uh, transport to, to the region. Um, several hundred, possibly several hundred Azerbaijani civilians are killed, but also Azerbaijanis uh, kill uh, several dozens of Armenian uh, uh, civilians in a village called Marava. But what I'm trying to say is that the conflict becomes ever more violent. In 1992, uh, the second largest city of Nagorno-Karabakh is captured by the Armenians, and that sort of seals the fate of the conflict. Armenians, in the wake of the capture of Shusha, are also able to establish, for the first time, a road linkage between Nagorno-Karabakh and Armenian mainland that would transport goods and services and military uh, materiel uh, to Nagorno-Karabakh to bolster their defenses and so on and so forth. 
which then creates conditions uh, for political instability in Azerbaijan and Heydar Aliyev, uh, the erstwhile communist leader of uh, Azerbaijan, who was by then living in Moscow and then returned to Nakhichevan, would make a political comeback and become president of Azerbaijan in 1993. Uh, he's, one of his first acts is try to just uh, to initiate a, a counteroffensive. The counteroffensive doesn't work. And by the time you get to 1994, uh, Azerbaijan has suffered cascading defeat after defeat, and Azerbaijan sues for peace. In the meanwhile, having lost uh, uh, seven adjacent to Nagorno Karabakh regions, and hundreds of thousands of Azerbaijani civilians have become refugees as a result. And by 1994, at the end of the war, this is the borders that emerge uh, in the region. Again, Armenia is not changed. Azerbaijan has the geographically changed. Nagorno-Karabakh is the darker shade. And the yellow, uh, you can see the territories that would be claimed by Nagorno-Karabakh. What ensues uh, is a peace negotiations uh, for close to, you know, for more than two decades, international mediation led by the US, the French, and Russians, trying to find a solution between Armenians. And what emerges is sort of a period of what has been called no war, no peace, but I like to call it some war, some peace because there were skirmishes all the time. I was in the military at the tail end of the war uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh, the first war. And uh, on my very first day, one of my very good friends actually would be killed by an Azerbaijani sniper in, in uh, on the very first day we were in the military positions. So there were skirmishes all the time. During the two years that I was in the military, there were still skirmishes on the border. And there were several attempts uh, that nearly ended in success, but overall were not successful. Azerbaijan at the last minute would uh, pull out of the negotiations, or not rather not pull out of the negotiations, but not agree to the overall framework. But the diplomacy would be considered would continue uh, well into the uh, well into 2020. But by the time you get to mid 2000 teens. Uh, it, would, it had become apparent that uh, Azerbaijan uh, would like to relitigate the war that it had lost. Uh, and we enter another interesting phase. Uh, Heydar Aliyev dies, and the power is transferred to his son. He dies in a, in a clinic in Cleveland, Ohio, and the power is transferred to his son who is utterly corrupt uh, and, and a dictator not uh, and lacks sort of the wisdom of his father. He's brash, he's young, and in his younger days, he was a playboy spending much time in Monaco and in, in Las Vegas casinos and so on and so forth. And Ilham Aliyev, who comes to power, starts rewriting Azerbaijani foreign and domestic politics, starts consolidating power, starts jailing opposition, starts uh, suppressing dissent and establishing a network of corruption through clan loyalty and so on and so forth. And if all of the elections since have been pretty much sham, none that have been recognized and free and fair by international organizations or any country that is in the democratic camp. Uh, notoriously, WikiLeaks Cable described Ilham Aliyev as the Michael Corleone, son, Sonny Corleone of the of the Godfather fame. He was that type of a person. And just to give you a glimpse uh, of uh, what we mean by sham elections, this uh, screenshot from the Washington Post when Azerbaijan uh, releases election results before even voting's, voting had started in the presidential elections, the title being, oops, Azerbaijan released election uh, results before voting had even started. So that is sort of 
the type of the polit politician that Il uh, that Haydar Aliyev's son Ilham is. But he manages uh, to reap enormous amount of financial benefits uh, uh, from a uh, oil pipeline that they built under the direction of his father uh, that connects Baku with the Turkish port city of Jehan, transporting billions worth of uh, hydrocarbons to the Western markets, making billions for himself, but also buying weaponry from, uh, uh, from Turkey, buying weapons from uh, Israel, buying weapons from Russia and so on and so forth. And he becomes ever, uh, he becomes quite confident in his ability and the ability of his army to start a new war. And meantime, he institutes a nationwide agenda of uh, Armenophobia, uh, essentially from, from cradle to the grave, uh, presenting to Azerbaijanis an image of Armenians as not unlike the image of the Armenians, image of, of, uh, of, of, of Armenians in the Ottoman era, in the Ottoman Empire uh, before the genocide and during the genocide, and not like uh, the uh, caricatured images of of Jews throughout Europe under Nazi rule. Uh, the propaganda is quite off the charts, and Armenians are portrayed in quite nefarious ways. So the positions of the parties had no overlap. Azerbaijan is unhappy with the status quo and began amassing weapons to change the situation. And the first sort of Azerbaijani attempt to change the situation was in 2016, where they attacked Nagorno-Karabakh. A couple of hundred Armenians are killed. A couple of hundred Azerbaijanis are killed. And Azerbaijan makes a small territorial gain, but nothing that would change the overall dynamic of the conflict. But it was the first sort of shot across the bow saying that Azerbaijan is not happy with the uh, status quo and it's going to resort to military to change the situation. International diplomatic efforts, meanwhile, remain ineffect ineffectual uh, and the cross-border clashes will increase. 2018, Armenia undergoes the so-called Velvet Revolution where a prime minister comes to power and decides to rewrite the negotiation script. And he starts further antagonizing Azerbaijan's president, inviting Azerbaijan's president to essentially attack Nagorno-Karabakh and to take it by force. And the war would come in 2020, in uh, September of 2020, would last 44 days. Uh, Nagorno-Karabakh army would be uh, decimated, uh, nearly 5,000 Armenian casualties, among whom would be also my very dear cousin, uh, nearly 5,000 Azerbaijani casualties also. Azerbaijan retakes most of the lands that it had lost in 1994, plus Shushi, or as Azerbaijan is called, Shusha. And you can see here on the map the new sort of configuration uh, after the War of 2020. Nagorno-Karabakh is that orange sliver now. As you can see, the white borders uh, and, and, and the entirety of Nagorno-Karabakh is now threatened uh, as a result, but they're through war throughout negotiations. A trilateral agreement is brokered by Russia in November 2020 by Vladimir Putin which proves to be sort of a Trojan horse for the Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh. Russia puts its uh, peacekeepers on the ground, boots on the ground, and everybody thought that now that Russia has troops in Nagorno-Karabakh, peace will reign indefinitely. But uh, whenever it comes to people like Vladimir Putin, there is nothing definite or indefinite. Uh, he's quite unpredictable. that way. But another thing that I would like uh, to sort of bring your attention to is that Azerbaijan also not only uh, took over the lands, but also is engaged in 
cultural erasure, uh, as I was saying that it has instituted propaganda machine, uh, saying that Armenians are interlopers and newcomers to the region. They have no historic presence. And to do that, Azerbaijan would resort essentially to the destruction of Armenian cultural heritage, churches, graves, gravestones. And one uh, extremely important uh, episode in the conflict is the 2005 destruction of the medieval Julfa Cemetery of 11,000 plus Armenian headstones. You can see intricate headstones that Azerbaijan would destroy. You can see the soldiers they're destroying and you can see a truck, a lorry, disposing of, of these gravestones of medieval Armenian uh, architectural wonders and, uh, and stone masonry. <laughs> Another episode is during the 2020 war, Azerbaijan twice bombed uh, the Cathedral of the Holy Savior in Shushi. You can see the hole uh, there, they bombed the church. You can see the, in, uh, the insides of the church having been destroyed and burned. And then Azerbaijan, after he took over Shushi, uh, is right now trying to essentially, uh, through a method of state vandalism, is uh, uh, reconfiguring uh, Shushi and calling it a Caucasian Albanian church rather than Armenian church or a, a Russian church rather than an Armenian church. It was a state-driven effort to show that Armenians are do not belong in Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, and so on and so forth. There is an important organization out of Cornell and Purdue universities that tracks all of these cultural changes. I highly suggest you to visit them, and if you can, donate to their cause. It's called Caucasus Heritage Watch. They do a fantastic forensic investigation using latest satellite technologies and imagery to trace the destruction of the Armenian uh, cultural heritage, and not only Armenian cultural heritage, but mostly Armenian cultural heritage in Nagorno-Karabakh. But let's sort of, there was a small brief digression, and let's let's talk about uh, what happened post-2020 war. So after 2020 war, Azerbaijan uh, imposed its will on Nagorno-Karabakh, but as, as I told you, there were Russian peacekeepers that were making sure that there was no, there would not be large scale war again. But as I said, uh, people like Putin are unpredictable and, and uh, what reigns, uh, what, what uh, I mean, his, his, his wishes and whims are unpredictable. And Azerbaijan uh, restocks its military again buying weapons by uh, from from israel turkey pakistan uh, italy and russia imposes a new uh, blockade on, on nagorno karabakh closing that corridor that i had already mentioned before lodging imposes a 10-month siege and at the end of the siege where people who are now beginning to die of hunger inside Nagorno-Karabakh because they can procure food, they can procure basic food stuff and basic hygiene material, medicine, uh, medical aid had uh, had dissipated and so on and so forth. Azerbaijan decides at the end of the 10 month siege to attack Nagorno-Karabakh and to impose a final solution on the question. Um, it would ignore all of the rulings of the international court, all the pronouncements by the US government, by France uh, and other Western countries and the EU to lift the blockade. Azerbaijan ignore, would ignore all of that. And there are reasons we can uh, talk in the Q&A. And at the end of it all, Azerbaijan attacks of September 19, three years almost to the day uh, attacks Nagorno-Karabakh again, and after two days, uh, fierce bombing and indiscriminate bombing over civilian structures and against the remaining military force of Nagorno-Karabakh, Azerbaijan takes over the entire territory, and what happens is the exodus of the Armenians from the region where they had essentially lived for the last 2,000 years. 
500 years or so of Armenian presence in the region goes quite uh, uh, far back. And this is uh, the exile uh, as seen from space. Uh, Maxar, which is one of the most uh, advanced uh, geospatial uh, imagery companies in the United States, tracked with their satellite the uh, Armenians living in droves by the tens of thousands uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, what seems to be for good. Uh, close to 120,000 Armenians uh, would leave the region. And today I read an interview with a uh, Red Cross representative that there is only 20, 2-0, 20 Armenians left in Nagorno-Karabakh. And these are mostly people with either oncological problems or mental problems or have nowhere else to go and no one that could sort of uh, help them move out. So out of 120,000 Armenians post-2020 war, there is basically no Armenian left, left in the region, which means no Armenian prayers are said in Armenian churches, no Armenian language poems poems are being recited by school children in schools there is no armenian uh, activity uh, the entire region has become essentially one ginormous ghost town and azerbaijan has moved its troops uh, and, and so on and so forth so at the end of it all uh, on uh, in, in September or October of, yeah, so September of 2020, 2023, Azerbaijan, Nagorno-Karabakh's leadership come out and put out a statement essentially announcing to the world the death of, a, of the rebel republic, uh, essentially saying that Nagorno-Karabakh is no more. Um, this, is, uh, this is a photo when I was in Nagorno-Karabakh two years ago. Uh, this is the last photo that I found in my camera that I took. This is a Russian peacekeeper guarding the road. And I just decided to finish my presentation with this melancholy photo of a Russian soldier that was supposed to keep the peace, but ended up not doing it. And Nagorno-Karabakh is now without its ancient Armenian community. And we can continue with the Q&A if you have questions. Thank you, Artyom, thank you for your um, presentation. And um, it's important, I think, for our audience to learn about the history of this conflict, about um, the experiences that, uh, as you mentioned, um, were not really covered, uh, talked about, even though despite the enormous scale of violence, of population movement, um, one would think it would be a centerpiece in any news coverage. Yet, um, I'm uh, thankful to you that you found time to share this history with us and um, also sharing your personal connection to uh, this conflict being in military during the first war and um, I'm also sorry to hear about the loss of your relative in the 2020 war. Unfortunately, Armenia being such a small country um, became quite a dark place after this war since almost every person you would talk to would have either a relative or a neighbor someone they definitely knew closely who they lost to that war. And that's also something that a lot of um, 
different audiences that when they hear about this war, when they hear about this conflict, do not imagine, but indeed the size, the small size of the country and the small number of the population that Armenia has, losing 5,000 soldiers from 18 to 23 year old or so is not a small number for a country of two and a half million population or less. Um, I will um, start with a question that was raised by um, Brookdale um, faculty in the sociology department. Um, and um, Didi Dimitra was asking, uh, what are the current global political interests, particularly American political interests in the region or lack thereof? that influences making uh, of this issue in mainstream American media at least, like wh why, why, why it is not mainstream? Yeah, so there is a lot of reasons uh, why it's not in the, it's, it's, it's not receiving nearly the coverage it deserves is, there's legion of reasons. But there are a couple of issues that I would like to point out. One is geopolitical region. Uh, geopolitical reason. Uh, Armenia has formal security ties with Russia. So in the Western mind, rightly or wrongly, Armenia is sort of associated with Russia. And, and what comes with that association is guilt by association. Time after time, some U.S. officials that I have dealt with they keep harping on this issue that Armenia, as long as it has these formal ties with Russia, this is kind of what you can expect and should expect. Uh, whether fair or not, it's it's a different question, but that is sort of uh, the reality. The other thing is that you would think that the independent media, like the CNN or New York Times or Washington Post, would really be independent and would really look at this unfolding uh, unfolding humanitarian catastrophe and speak to, to power and so on and so forth. But as I've said on other occasions, uh, it bears reminding and reiterating here is that when it comes to the coverage of domestic politics, American independent media acts quite independently and occasionally set the agenda and set the, the direction of the political discourse in this country. New York Times can take up any number of issues of small even interest and make it into a big issue where the issue would end up being probably debated at presidential debates and so on and so forth. But when it comes to foreign policy and foreign US government engagement, a lot of these issues fall by the wayside. And American press, independent as they are or as they claim to be, ended up essentially becoming stenographers for the State Department and reflecting the State Department or the White House's position on number of any number of foreign policy issues for, for several reasons. Number one, they don't want to lose access to their sources inside the White House or the State Department or the CIA. So they have to play ball on how they cover these issues. And one very, you know, telling example of this when Armenian, you know, activists, Armenian scholars were, you know, knocking on doors and raising, you know, hell and and blasting their horns, trying to raise awareness of what was happening, and then the mainstream media was utterly silent or uh, not paying enough attention on this issue. One telling example of this was New York Times at the end of the ethnic cleansing campaign when 120,000 Armenians had already moved out, had been deported, had been kicked out of their homes in Nagorno-Karabakh, the New York Times headline on the issue was almost no one saw it coming. Where there were, you know, thousands of us saying that Azerbaijan is instituting an ethnic cleansing campaign. And here, the newspaper of record, probably the most influential print uh, media in the world is coming out saying no one saw it coming. I mean, come on, give me a break, right? So that's another reason. The third reason has to do probably with 
the issue of Iran and Israel. Israel is, you know, is uh, has good ties with Azerbaijan, buys cheap oil, sells expensive weaponry to Azerbaijan, and on top of everything else, uses Azerbaijan as as uh, as um, one of its most important uh, launch pads for intelligence operations against Iran and pilfering. Uh, very uh, significant in, uh, in intelligence out of Iran through Azerbaijan and so on and so forth. So I think that's another reason why uh, the United States is sort of trying to disengage uh, in, in the matter or not or not prioritize the matter. And, and the fourth is, of course, the, the uh, carbohydrates uh, or or, or oil, another way of saying. Nineteen twenties or thirties, there was a Mississippi senator whose name I can't remember. Uh, it said something uh, that sort of still rings true to this day. The senator can't remember again his name. Said something like, "Show me an oil well, and I'll show you a foreign policy." And I think that's one of the reasons. I mean, it's, it sounds quite cynical, but sometimes cynicism is realism especially when it comes to these issues. And so that's sort of the confluence of three or four reasons that I can think of uh, why uh, the State Department hasn't prioritized and why the American the mainstream large media with large following hasn't prioritized to these issues. And of course, we can go and, and talk more and more about this, but I don't want to dissect to murder the issue. <laughs> but it should give you an idea. Thank you. Um, yes, we also have um, a number of um, uh, questions that I will try to combine together because all of them in one or another way touch upon the issue of not just the United States, but international communities reaction or lack of reaction to the blockade and the ethnic cleansing that happened. Um, why the international community did not intervene on behalf of Armenians of Artsakh? What was the role of such international institutions as ICC and so on? So we have a number of questions about this, if you could briefly reflect. Yeah, the ICC, the International Criminal Court, and the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, both have come out strongly in, insofar as there have been cases brought against Azerbaijan in these courts, they have both come out and pronounced uh, very favorable to Armenia and Armenians' positions. But these two organizations lack the enforcement mechanism. It's one thing when a, let's say a prosecutor comes out and says okay this person has killed that person there is a policeman that is authorized and delegated to go and arrest the offending party right when it comes to the international law these things become essentially unenforceable and parties that are signatories to these organizations take it upon themselves to enforce this law but Azerbaijan is not. And this, and who is going to enforce these things? Well, the only thing that comes to mind is either individual countries taking initiative in their hands and imposing punishment, imposing cost on Azerbaijan, and imposing sanctions and so on and so forth. Or there is another mechanism that has proven to be dysfunctional over the last several decades is the UN Security Council. There have been efforts to bring the issue to the UN Security Council, but there have been several powerful countries that have essentially undermined these efforts, either not wanting to engage, or insofar as they have engaged, the resolutions have been watered down and insignificant, and so on and so forth. And of course, you have to take into account that there are bigger fishes that are being fried, right? The conflict in Ukraine, uh, and 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 so on and so forth, where these issues are much more prioritized than whatever happens in a God-forsaken corner uh, 
somewhere in between Europe and Asia where a lot of people, probably majority of the people cannot even point on the map. So this that's another aspect of it. And of course, again, Azerbaijan has lots of uh, oil, has lots of money, and uh, there has been lots of corruption uh, in in European politics, where Azerbaijan has proven, you know, to be quite adept at influencing political uh, political decision making by buying off, literally buying off, European parliamentarians and so on and so forth. Where these parliamentarians have either subverted efforts to uh, to introduce, you know, resolutions or legislation to uh, to hold Azerbaijan accountable, you know. Well, um, this probably um, is also a good segue to the next set of questions that we have, which is about Russia and um, about Russia's interest in both Armenia and Azerbaijan. Um, so one of the questions, for instance, was mostly about uh, whether Azerbaijan is more interested in siding with uh, Russia is interested in more siding with Azerbaijan or Armenia, and why? Uh, but also, since you have conducted your thorough research on Russia's behavior throughout this entire period from the 90s or even before to today, um, could you speak to Russia's role in the conflict and and today? Yeah, so Russia's role has been quite complex, but at the same time has been quite transparent. Russia's role, you know, it has not been one dimensional. It is a large country. Uh, it has enormous uh, geopolitical interests in various parts of the world, and occasionally it uses its hard force to redraw maps, right? But at the same time, Russia is quite transparent and, 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 and you can see its actions that have been telegraphed uh, miles of, uh, from miles afar in that regard. So Russia's complex has been, Russia's, Russia's uh, conduct on this has been uh, over the last several decades from you know, 1988 when, when, when the conflict first broke out until the 2020 war publicly had as always has come out using almost the exact same verbiage, the exact same wording in calling for a mutually accessible, uh, acceptable solution. Whether it has been Yeltsin, whether it has been Gorbachev, whether it has been Vladimir Putin or their foreign secretaries or, or ministers of foreign affairs or not, their verbiage has been always, almost always the same. Sometimes I think like there is a certain safe or there is a you know set of instructions and talking points held whenever there were tensions that would come out and just use copy paste from this text. And but also Russia has its own geopolitical interests. So whenever it has needed concessions from Armenia its press coverage or the pronouncement of its public officials have been favoring Azerbaijan to put pressure on Armenia to fall in line on any number of issues of interest to the Russian Federation or to Vladimir Putin. These days, these things are inseparable from each other. When we say Russia, we mean, we mean Putin. And when we say Putin, we mean Russia. It's like coterminous. And whenever Russia has needed concessions from Azerbaijan, its press coverage and the public pronouncements of its officials have been sort of pro Yerevan. So it's occasionally it has been pro Yerevan, occasionally it has been pro Baku, but at all times these pronouncements and policy conduct has been pro Moscow. So Russia has been juggling it, has been playing both sides against each other in in many ways to keep them in check, to keep them dependent on Russia and Russian, uh, and, and to make sure that Russian foreign policy uh, priorities are not compromised or fully damaged in the region. So in this period, at this time, in the Russian foreign policy calculation, 
people have probably come uh, embrace have have come to embrace the belief that uh, sort of not to support Armenia is much more beneficial to Russia geopolitically, politically, and economically than to support Armenia against Azerbaijan. And uh, and Russia has you know economic goals that is trying to pursue. It is trying to have connections with Iran through railroad networks and road networks through Azerbaijan, uh, with, with which Russia has common borders, but with Armenia, it doesn't. So, and Russia has a military base in Armenia, so he think, and of course, Turkey uh, breathing on Armenia's neck is there. So Russia probably has come to think that its military presence in Armenia uh, is quite tanked for granted, and Armenians will not try uh, to change geopolitical orientation. And even if they try, they may not be able to successful because Turkey. So it's a very complex affair. Uh, it's it's, uh, but again, like I said, it's quite transparent. You know. And since you mentioned uh, the geopolitical uh, situation, uh, we had also um, a question about Armenia's alignment with West versus Russia. Um, after the 2018 revolution in Armenia, after the change uh, of the government, there were some conversations about where Armenia goes from here and um but the war changed a lot and the consequences and the ethnic cleansing and humanitarian crisis have affected armenia as well as COVID, which affected the entire world so um what is now the situation with armenia's uh, geopolitical choices and um alignments well, there is always choices, but choices can be good, bad, and ugly. <laughs> and Armenia, at the, at, the, at, the, at the time, on paper, has a good choice to make. Uh, obviously, it can, uh, you know, reorient itself uh, to the West. There is lots of willingness in the Armenian government and in the foreign ministry and so on and so forth. It's it, it, but at the same time, uh, it doesn't mean that Russia all of a sudden is going to go away. Uh, I don't know if you have seen uh, the Otto Megoyan movie Ararat uh, from, two, from early 2000s. It's a movie about the Armenian genocide that I suggest people to watch. But there is this one episode when a Turkish volley or a governor is brutalizing Armenians and and, and 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 America comes in the mix in the conversation, and the actor, the the great Canadian Greek actor Elias Kotias says, "America, it's so far away. Russia is next door. Russia is there. Russia has a military presence in Armenia, and Armenia, as much as it tries, it cannot change its neighborhood. Yeah, uh, you know, it, it you cannot change your neighbors." One way to change your neighbors is you buy a house in a different neighborhood. But Armenia is stuck. It, it, it's stuck in that neighborhood. So, yes, on paper, it may look like, uh, you know, there is there is alternatives to Armenia's security arrangement and security architecture. But at the same time, would the West be willing to engage in the security arrangement that Armenia is seeking. The West is not going to engage in any security arrangement that is not beneficial. Western organization and Western countries are not charitable organizations and they're not altruistic organizations and none of them are coming to Armenia's rescue for Armenia's sake. If they come for Armenia's rescue, it will be for the sake of the Western interest, geopolitical, political and economic so uh, yes armenia seems to have a choice but at the same time you cannot discount the large russia factor that is not going to go easily away so if armenia decides to make these changes 
and I've warned and I've spoken about this many times before, there needs to be taken account the very real humanitarian costs that may be coming in Armenia's way. And one sort of harbinger of these things were the ethnic cleansing of the Armenians. What if all of a sudden Russia decides to say, okay, Turkey, have your way with Armenia. And Turkey may just have its way with Armenia. Because Turkey is as unpredictable as Russia is on geopolitical matters. And Turkey has strong geopolitical interests and, and wishes to uh, project power further, especially under Erdogan. Right. Um, I think we have time for one last question. And um, maybe uh, it's my bias towards the questions about refugee crisis, but I'm going to ask that one. Um, we talked about the ethnic cleansing and about 100,000 Armenians from Artsakh um, forced out of their homes. Um, could you um, speak to what happened to those refugees? Um, we saw those caravans moving, how they moved, where they found, uh, found if they found shelter, and um, also what is next for them? Yeah, so essentially what we ended up with is 120,000 all of a sudden homeless people, essentially. Armenia doesn't have the financial and economic wherewithals to house all of these people. Uh, so a lot of these people ended up either trying to find uh, uh, rental properties that have been vacant to rent these at enormous costs. These people have no jobs. Uh, the government assistance that is coming their way is measly and paltry and insignificant to be able to provide them good housing conditions or good amount of calories that would sustain a healthy lifestyle, for instance. A lot of, uh, a lot of these people have ended up living uh, by the dozens in 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 sport in in high school gyms and so on and so forth, or in abandoned uh, and below par housing arrangements and so on and so forth. So their lives are uh, uh, it, it's quite miserable the conditions uh, that the refugees find themselves in, and I could not I mean. Uh, you know, as someone who has been teaching courses on ethnic conflict and genocide for years, you know, more than a decade, I never thought that this would again happen to the Armenians hundred years later, where you have entire cities and 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 populations moving out, finding this, themselves in 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 dire straits and in total destitution. Uh, what may happen next is that a lot of these uh, Armenian refugees, uh, several thousand of them, have have left Armenia. Uh, we don't know exactly what would happen. There is conversation that some of these people would like to move back to reclaim their homes in Azerbaijan, in 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 Nagorno Karabakh, but I find it uh, truly hard to believe that uh, Ilham Aliyev and the Azerbaijani leadership would allow this to happen without some sort of further damaging concession from the Armenian side. That's one thing. Another thing is if they move, just imagine putting your kids through an educational system that calls Armenians rats and parasites and and murderers and, and so on and so forth. And, and so no one really can say with certainty or a reasonable degree of certainty what will happen next. But what I can talk about what can happen next uh, if, if if the conflict continues is that, you know, Azerbaijan has, yes, ethnically cleansed and sort of reached a final solution with Nagorno-Karabakh, but all, Azerbaijan also has designs on Armenia proper, the uh, southern part of Armenia that it likes to 
take over militarily to create a land bridge with the uh, exclave of Nakhichevan, much like the Russians pushed for a land bridge through southern Crimea, uh, through southern Ukraine to Crimea. So that is also a very distinct possibility, and uh, uh, I am keeping my eye on it and trying to, you know, my utmost try to understand and see what 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 comes next. But it's a quite real possibility, and this time it's not just Nagorno-Karabakh that's going to be attacked, but Azerbaijan is going to attack southern Armenia, and there are indications that there is a full-scale preparation for that. There have been several dozen uh, heavy lifter airplanes moving weapons from Turkey and again Israel uh, to Azerbaijan, which appears to be for this explicit purpose. I wish I could say that um, there is a positive theme to end this conversation with, but unfortunately, Armenia is in a situation that it's in imminent danger. And yes. that's why it is important to have these conversations, to educate our audiences about what's happening there. Um, because sometimes um, these, um, as you mentioned, far away uh, countries get lost within the news coverage and people are not aware of what's happening to hundreds of hundreds of thousands of people um, far away. Um, but there are families who are struggling to survive. There are there is a country that is in danger. Uh, its existence is in danger. And we somehow do not pay attention to that. So thank you for talking about this difficult topic today with us. And um, huge thanks to our audience for joining us this evening. Uh, we are running out of time, so I'm going to thank you all for being with us this Wednesday evening. Once again, thanks to our staff, Changes staff, Suzanne, Susan, and Rachel for making this Zoom program possible. Um, we're grateful to our sponsors, um, Pam and Howard Dorman, Marie and Joan Haitayan, Cynthia McCormack, Adrian and Richard McComber, and to our donors and members for their generosity and support. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at Change's future programs, be it virtually or a change in person. Have a good night.